It is finally time for me to show you the creation of my first game model, a tire. But what are these green lines? And how did I make the model roll instead of slide? These are some of the things we are going to explore today, so welcome to my fourth devlog episode. Previously I tested my soft body implementations on either really simple models like a cube or a sphere, or I used the Stanford Bunny. But now I needed a tire model that I could actually use for the game. So no more downloading, I needed to create it myself. To get some inspiration I paid attention to car wheels every time I went outside. I liked the size of this one and the profile of this one. But of course I didn't just want to copy them, so I sketched a simple rim structure and a profile to model. For the size I tried to understand the tire code that is written on it. It seems that this number is the maximum width of the tire in millimeters, this number is the ratio of height over width and this number is the diameter of the rim in inches. So after one attempt to model the tire I started with the rim. To learn how to create these models in Blender I followed this video for the rim and this for the tire. From using Blender in the past there were a few shortcuts ingrained into my brain but I am really no expert. I put a bunch of videos I found the most helpful into a playlist if you are interested. But please do not ask me how these modifiers work. I spent a very frustrating hour trying to wrap the profile around the rim even with the tutorial. But after getting this to work and some further optimizations I was quite happy with the result. I didn't exactly stick to the numbers in the tire code because I didn't and still don't know how they were exactly measured so I ended up measuring the wheel myself. Which was just as weird as it sounds since it was just some random car. Because my tire model had way too many triangles to be such a small part of the game I created a simplified model for rendering. To make the simplified model appear to have a profile I baked the normals of the detailed model onto it. And with that the pain of implementing normal mapping began. In theory it's a really simple concept actually. Instead of only defining normals for whole faces or in this case vertices and linearly interpolating between them to get these smooth normals you create a texture of normals that is then mapped onto your object. This way the triangle normals can be arbitrarily detailed even inside of the triangle enabling the illusion of a profile even though the tire is completely flat. But you might have noticed the normals on the model look very different than the one in the normal map. This is because normal maps typically don't define their normals in object space like you would assume. Instead they are stored in tangent space. For a regular function z of x the tangent of a point is a line that only touches this point locally. The tangent space at that position looks like this. The x axis is parallel to the tangent direction and the z axis is perpendicular to the tangent direction. As you can see relative to this space the surface normal is always constant. It is the frame's z axis. This is also why the default tangent normal is this constant bluish color. They are always the z axis. Extending this to three dimensions the tangent of a point on the mesh is a plane whose normal aligns with the geometry normal. The tangent space concept is the same but with an additional y tangent also called the bitangent of the x tangent. However in 3D there are an infinite number of tangent space definitions for each point if you rotate them around their z vector. So which one is chosen? To keep the texture consistent, meaning all normals in the texture are defined in the same space, the x and y vectors of the tangent space are chosen to align with u and v texture directions. You can ignore any positional offset in these visualizations since normal transformations don't include translation. So now that we know exactly what space the normals are in, how do we convert them to object space? I think there is a really intuitive way to understand this problem. For that you have to understand that a matrix, like this for example, is, in geometric terms, nothing more than a coordinate system in space. The 3D columns here represent the x, y and z axis of the system. Multiplying a point with the matrix does nothing more than transform it from its local coordinate space into the global coordinate space where the matrix itself is defined in. So first the point is relative to the local matrix system and after the multiplication it is relative to the global system. Normal mapping has a pretty similar situation. Instead of a point P we now have a tangent space normal that is local to the tangent space matrix 
which is defined by the tangent, bitangent and normal vectors, hence the short form TBN. When this TBN matrix is defined in object space, then multiplying the tangent space normal with it results in the object space normal that we needed. The tangent normal is known. It is just the normal of the triangle that we are looking at. But what about the tangent and bitangent vectors? Luckily, for a triangle, they can be computed easily using the following relation. If the normal vector of the TBN matrix is dropped, the resulting matrix represents the coordinate system of the normal map in object space, again ignoring any positional offsets. It converts a direction in the normal map or texture space to the same direction in object space. For example, it takes this 2D direction in the normal texture and converts it into the same 3D direction in object space on the tire model. The cool thing is, we have two of these pairs given, because for each triangle we have object space coordinates and texture coordinates. So this vector is given in texture and object space, and this one too. Writing this as a system of equations lets us compute the tangent and bitangent vectors. We just need to invert this 2 by 2 matrix to compute the tangent and bitangent vectors for a single triangle of the model. And that's the basic idea of normal mapping. The tangent, bitangent and normal vectors for each triangle can be parsed per vertex to the shaders, where sampled normals can then be transformed. Depending on your TBN definition, you'd need to convert the object space normals to world space after the transformation or directly convert the TBN matrix to world space in the vertex shader. Unfortunately, the devil lies in the details of the implementation. Since I had never done this before, I spent a full day trying to debug the mistakes I made. I want to summarize them here so you don't have to do them. First of all, I used STB image to load the normal map but I wasn't aware of the fact that loading an image keeps it in sRGB space if it was saved that way. So when I used them in the shader, they were completely wrong as you can see here. The normal map itself however just looks a bit discolored. To fix the image in the shader you can tell OpenGL that it should use sRGB as its internal image format. This way the texture is automatically converted when requesting a sample. Another thing I was a bit confused about was the tangent space interpolation. You would assume that the tangent space is constant over a single triangle. But how does this fit together with smooth vertex normals? It turns out you can interpolate the tangent space too. When baking normal maps in Blender, the tangent space normal is not necessarily the same one for the triangle. It is the same that is used for shading. So you have a few options. First, you can use flat shading, making the computation of the TBN matrix pretty easy because it is constant for a single triangle. However, because of this, the TBN matrix changes abruptly at edges of the model, which can lead to visible artifacts even without mid mapping or multi sampling. So, I wouldn't recommend this. Second, you can bake the normal map using your custom normals that are adjusted using Blender's Mark Sharp tool or AutoSmooth tool. This might capture some model features better but leads to the same artifacts as for flat shading at sharp edges. In addition to that I couldn't use it for the soft body because the exported model doesn't include sharp edges so it wasn't possible for me to calculate the custom smooth normals. What I would suggest is to bake the normals with completely smooth normals. The only downside of this is that sharp edges where the smooth normals change abruptly don't capture details as well. But the artifacts are gone and it is clear how to compute the TBN matrix. Just reorthogonalize the flat triangle tangent and bitangent vectors using the smooth normal in the fragment shader. By the way, did you know that smooth normals are not computed by simply averaging them? You need to weight the triangle normal according to the angle with which the triangle is connected to the vertex, which I didn't know either. Lastly, depending on your model, the bitangent vector is not necessarily the cross product between the normal and the tangent vectors. This is because in my case the normal map is generated only for half the profile and then flipped for the other side. And now maybe you can see why tangent space normals are so useful. For my tire model I can use this small normal section for every segment, which would not be possible using an object space normal map. Finally, after going to bed like this on the previous day, I had correctly normal mapped the tire. Though I felt it still looked kinda flat, so I wasted another chunk of time trying to bake ambient occlusion maps like I did for the normal map. I just couldn't get it to work.
At some point I noticed that Blender actually used all objects to render the AO map, so even though only the two in question are selected, the others must be disabled for render. With that I could get some more depth into the model. And fortunately, using AO maps is not as difficult as normal maps. It's just a factor for the otherwise constant ambient lighting value. Before simulating the tire, I wanted to prepare the scene for some soft body experiments. My idea for building the world is to create a few models that are then reused and placed all over the world. For this scene, for example, I just used a cube and a ramp. Now I was ready to simulate my tire. So I took the non-profile version and applied the plugin that I showed last episode to get a tetrahedral tire mesh. And when loading it into the game, this wasn't really what I expected. But it was just my fault for making an error in the surface triangle extraction, right? Unfortunately, no. There seemed to be something inherently wrong with the generated mesh. When simulating, it wasn't just that the performance was terrible. When running in optimized mode, you can see it didn't even look sensible. After some debugging, I noticed that the tetrahedron mesh had a bunch of flat tetrahedrons. So now I had two options. Either I add even more patches to my tetrahedral mesh loader, or I throw hours of work into the trash and I seek for alternative generators. And because I wasn't sure how to do the patches one, I went for the trash can and the alternatives. There are quite a few open source ones, but at the time I only found TetGen. It definitely seemed more sophisticated than the Blender plugin and also has a complete documentation. The only problem was that the source code has a weird license and I wasn't even sure if I could use the program for my game. But after some very professional research on this topic, I think as long as I don't include the related code into my game, I am fine. I downloaded the code from some unofficial GitHub repository, compiled it and there was my new generator. Because OBJ files are not supported, I passed it my tire model as a PLY file instead. After an almost instant execution time, there were several resulting files that each contained some specific information about the tetrahedral model. The node file contains the positional information of each point. In this case there are 1176 3D points. The edge file contains all surface edges given by the indices of the connected points. Similarly, the faces and ELI files contain descriptions of all triangles and tetrahedrons, again using point indices. Lastly, the NAY file that was specifically requested to be generated with the minus N flag contains the neighboring tetrahedrons of every tetrahedron given as indices. I fed all of the mentioned files into a custom Python script that processes them and outputs a binary file that contains my mesh in such a format that I can read it easily into my program. I used Python for the parsing because it's way easier than in C. The only special thing in the script is the extraction of all edges because the edges file only contained surface edges, which is not sufficient for simulating the distance constraints. Even though I had to put my old parser into the trash, I was really happy to finally have a perfect tetrahedral mesh. There was just one small problem. This is of course not what my tire is supposed to look like. In the process of creating the tetrahedral mesh, all additional vertex information got lost. I needed a way to attach my render mesh with normals and texture coordinates to my simulation mesh and make it deform in the same way. I could just try to match the vertices of both models and transfer the normals and text cords this way. However, to also fix the performance problems, I created an even lower resolution simulation model and matching doesn't work this way anymore. So instead I implemented the vertex skinning mode described in this YouTube video. Before the simulation starts, when both meshes are located at the same position, each point of the render mesh is permanently associated with the tetrahedron of the simulation mesh. I chose the one tetrahedron whose center has the smallest distance to the point in question. Let's look at this point as an example. Its closest tetrahedron is here. Next, the relative position of the point to the tetrahedron is computed using barycentric coordinates. A while ago I was a bit scared of barycentric coordinates, but now I want to convince you that it's actually relatively simple. For our point P, its barycentric coordinates B0, B1, B2 and B3 are like weights to the corner positions of the tetrahedron. When these weights are multiplied with their respective corner positions and then summed, P is obtained. However, this equation alone is not sufficient. Rewriting it in matrix form, we can see that there are four variables for three equations. 
there are an infinite number of solutions. This is why there is another restriction. All barycentric coordinate components should sum up to 1. With this addition, each point P is uniquely described by one barycentric coordinate vector. For example, if P lies on T0, then only B0 is 1 and all the other components are 0. If P is in the exact middle of the edge of, say, T1 and T2, then both B1 and B2 are 0.5 and the other two are 0, and so on. Remember, the barycentric coordinates are like a local description of P relative to the tetrahedron. It's what we want to compute. Let's insert the sum to 1 equation into the matrix. Now there are 4 variables and 4 equations. Assuming the tetrahedron is not degenerate, the barycentric coordinates are obtained by rearranging. In theory, that's all. Just invert the matrix and multiply it with your point. But because inverting a 4x4 matrix is quite cumbersome, there is a tiny improvement we can make. Let's start again from the basic equations. Instead of writing them as a matrix system directly, the second equation can be reordered and inserted into the first equation. With another round of multiplying, reordering and factoring out the b's, a different matrix equation is obtained. This time, the number of variables matches the number of equations, so it can be solved by inverting this 3x3 matrix. The final barycentric coordinate, B3, can be computed by using the equation we inserted in the beginning. So this is what I did for each point of the render mesh before the simulation started. Compute its closest tetrahedron, compute the barycentric coordinates and store this information for the point. Ideally, you would make this part of the asset creation step to reduce loading times because this double loop is pretty bad. The barycentric coordinates are now like relative positions. While simulating, I constantly get a differently deformed tetrahedral mesh and just update the render mesh points using its barycentric coordinates and this equation. However, sometimes the deformation had some artifacts. While debugging, I noticed that the matrix of these points look different than the ones of the other points. So instead of just choosing the closest tetrahedron, I chose the closest tetrahedron out of the ones that had the best matrix. In this case, I chose the matrix that has the largest determinant, meaning it's furthest from zero. With this fix, it works exactly like I imagined. For the remaining time of this video, let's talk about better collisions and friction. What? While my previous implementation, which just sets point to the ground height, actually conforms to the extended position based dynamics way of doing collisions, it is of course too simple. In the most general case, a collision between two objects occurs when their surfaces touch in a point P. Because P is the only such point locally, there exists a plane that is tangent to P for both objects. The normal vector of this plane is the contact or collision normal n. If we would have some sort of continuous computing machine that could for example compute the exact value of integrals, all we'd have to do is to adjust the velocities of the two objects in P and we'd be done. However, because this is currently impossible, we have to deal with cases where the objects are penetrating. XPBD proposes to handle these cases by applying a stiff distance constraint between two contact points P0 and P1 along normal direction. They word it a bit differently in the rigid body paper, but it's essentially like this constraint. It then acts like an infinitely stiff spring that pulls the two points back along normal direction. Though I have to be honest, I don't quite know what these values should actually be in this general case. They call it contact positions, but I don't think it is the original point P that is now at these two positions, since they are not that easy to compute. Rather, it seems to me that the two points are chosen like here, where moving them in normal direction separates the two bodies with minimal distance. For now, this isn't really a problem, because as we'll see later, for simple cases where only points, lines and planes are involved, the exact position of both contact points doesn't actually matter. Also, the equations in the paper are overly complex for my scenario, so we'll look at them in more detail in later episodes. Currently, I only support a single soft body and a bunch of static collision objects. The static collision objects, like the ramp or cube, are just a collection of triangle planes. While this is of course also true for the soft body, to keep it simple, I decided to look at the collisions here on a per point basis meaning there are only point-object collisions and each point is handled independently from the others. So let's just look at this point here. Before I can handle this collision, I need to detect it. 
At the beginning of each simulation step, where normally only the position of every point is integrated, I append an intersection test for each static collision object. For each triangle of the object, I load its corner position into this P array and then test whether the vector from any point on the triangle to the point is oriented in the same direction as the triangle normal direction, using the dot product. If that is the case, the point cannot lie inside, so I set is inside to zero, which is defined up here. If every time the vector points in opposite normal direction, is inside will remain one. A collision is found and inserted into an array as this struct object previously initialized to zero. In addition to the point index, the collision struct also stores a point, a normal, and two lambda variables for later use. The point and normal are initialized for the closest triangle that was found, which is why I need this additional variable and check. I used the projection of the colliding point as the collision struct point, but in theory I could have just used any point, such as P0. I know this code is extremely inefficient, but it's very simple and easy to explain. Ideally, you would want to rule out as many potential collisions as possible before going into detail like this, but that's for a future episode. The collected constraints are then handled like any other constraint in a solver loop. Let's look at this function. It takes the colliding point P0 here as a pointer x, its inverse mass w, the other collision point P1 with the normal of the collision plane, and lastly a lambda variable like usual for a constraint. The goal is to solve our collision constraint using the XPVD formulas, so we need the derivatives and inverse masses. The inverse mass of P0 is given here. Since P1 is static, we have two options. We can either set its inverse mass to zero, meaning it has an infinite mass and can therefore not be moved, or we can define P1 as a constant in our constraint, making it even easier to derive. I'll go with the second option. So the constraint looks like this. The only necessary derivative is with respect to P0. The value is just a normal vector. Because alpha is zero and the normal vector is normalized, delta lambda simplifies. Our only point P0 here contained inside of X gets a much simpler update too. So to complete the function, first the constraint value is computed using the vector from P1 to P0. It only needs to be solved if it is less than 0 because otherwise there'd be no collision. Then we can just compute delta lambda and delta X according to the formulas we just derived and update the corresponding values. So what this all just results in is we need to project the collision point P0 onto the collision plane along normal direction. And this is also what I meant earlier. As you can see the exact location of P1 doesn't matter as long as it lies on the plane. Now differently oriented collision surfaces are supported too. Instead of falling through the ramp, the tire slides down. This is because the weight of a point creates a gravitational force Fg, but the surface underneath only resists with a force Fn that acts in normal direction. Breaking Fg down into a part parallel to Fn and a part perpendicular to Fn, this downsliding force is even more apparent. Fn completely resists the parallel part, but does nothing against the perpendicular one. The point is accelerated downwards. Discretized, this means the point is moved down into the object and then back to the surface again in normal direction. To make it stick to the surface, we need to talk about friction. Let's consider the case where the point is currently not moving. Static friction then counteracts this downsliding force with the friction force Fs as long as it is smaller than some mu s times the normal force. Mu s is a constant for the two materials interacting with each other and determined experimentally. As long as the equation here holds, Fs is always exactly equal to Fg perpendicular to n. No acceleration happens. Static friction is implemented by extending the collision constraint to remove tangential motion if said condition applies. For that, we also need the previous point P0 prime, the static friction force coefficient mu s and another lambda variable. Let's say P0 prime was here. Gravity pushed the point into the object and the collision solver would push it back to the surface. XPBD proposes to combine the collision constraint with a very similar one that prevents tangential motion. The tangential motion of the point can be computed by subtracting the normal component of this vector from itself. This way we get the tangential motion vector which would point from P0 prime to this point. Delta lambda is then the length of this vector divided by the inverse mass, similar to the collision constraint. 
The condition for static friction is that the tangential force is smaller than mu s times the normal force. Maybe you remember from my second episode that the lambda variables are proportional to the force values. So we can just use them to check this condition. If it is true, we can reset the tangential motion. Now if the tire is at rest on the ramp, it doesn't slide down. However, if the tire is already in motion, it further accelerates without slowing down. This is where kinetic or dynamic friction comes into play. The kinetic friction force is equal to mu k times the normal force and x in tangential direction. At contact, it is always present. XPBD suggests to integrate this force in a completely new algorithm step, the velocity update. It happens after everything else, so after the velocity is computed. For each collision, we compute the velocity of that point in tangential direction by first computing the velocity's normal components and then subtracting it from the velocity. The computation is very similar to the positional constraints, but this works on velocities instead. Now, using this relation here, we want to perform an explicit integration of this force to apply it to the velocity. Again, you might remember from my second episode that the absolute value of a distance constraint force can be obtained with the lambda variable. Since our constraint is similar to a distance constraint, the resulting expression looks like this. Contrary to the static friction implementation, this time we need the exact value, so we divide by h squared, where h is the time step. Next, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Putting the mass on the other side, we have our acceleration. Finally, an explicit integration step can be performed by approximating the acceleration using the difference quotient, which you might remember from high school. And there is our velocity delta. As you can see, this is what is computed in the code too. The value is just clamped to be the length of the tangential velocity at max because we don't want to accelerate the object in opposite direction. The absolute value is then applied in negative tangential direction. This makes the tire resist sliding down the ramp. Also, both of these forces allow the tire to roll. Without static friction, you can see the object doesn't accelerate downwards, but maybe you can see it still creeps down because of the collision point projection in normal direction. So both the static and the kinetic part contribute to the simulation of friction. My implementation is not without problems though. First, because I only used point plane intersections, when the tire collides with the ramp edge like this, you can see edge collisions are not handled. Second, if the tire does not lie on the ground, but instead stands up like this, it slightly moves, which is not very realistic. I am not entirely certain why that happens, but I think it has to do with the distance constraints. At some point I will work on that and also try out some of the different things you guys suggested to me for solving the rotation problem in episode 2. Thank you for those suggestions, really appreciate you sharing your ideas. And that's it so far. We will revisit the tire when connecting it to the wheel rim, which also needs to get the proper material. To do that I first want to implement rigid bodies. If you are wondering why I started with the soft body instead of rigid bodies, this is because like I have shown you I am using a mass spring model to simulate the soft body, which is quite easy to understand. Everyone who has taken physics in school has probably seen Hooke's law before in one form or another and the concept of a spring is really intuitive. Rigid bodies however, especially 3D, are nowhere to be seen in school. Or do you remember your teacher talk about the inertia tensor? I don't. From what I've seen, even more complex than that are fluid simulations. And finally, if you want to simulate actually physically based deformations, you can use stress and strain tensors and the finite element method like real engineers do to validate the robustness of bridges for example. But I still have a lot to learn before I could explain that in a YouTube video. So you don't need to worry about me trying to explain that for the next few episodes. Instead, be prepared to shift gears to rigid bodies. I think there are some beautiful derivations for equations like these and I am especially excited to share them with you. So my plan for the next episodes is to first look at raw unconstrained rigid body physics and then for collisions move back to XPBD to see how it handles rigid bodies. Thanks for watching. 